All right, welcome to Pandemic Installment 6. I'm Linda Kuhn, Dean of the Honors College, and as I like to say, pandemic doesn't stop for the weekend. So here we are on Saturday with an awesome audience. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce our distinguished professor who's going to talk today, and that's Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Arkansas, Christian Forbes. And Christian is a disease ecologist and echoimmunologist who completed his bachelor and master's degrees in his native Australia. He then moved to Finland for his PhD studies where he stayed on as a postdoc. But he has spent enormous time tracking wildlife in Kenya, South Africa, and the US. And Christian has diverse interest in population and disease ecology with a particular focus on the maintenance and transmission of zoonotic wild, uh, pathogens in wildlife and the effects of anthropogenic environmental changes on these processes. And I would just like to say that I wanted somebody that could do the environmental background. And so I called uh, Professor Peter Ungar, who runs our environmental dynamics program. And I asked who would be best. And Dr. Ungar said, Christian Forbes. So I'm going to turn over the mic and the stage to Dr. Christian Forbes, or as I like to call him now, Batman. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dean Kuhn. And thank you also, Dr. Hancox, for, um, for setting this up and giving me the opportunity to, to tell you a little bit about what I do. And really what I'm going to try and get across with this is essentially tell you how a pathogen goes from being an animal pathogen to a human pathogen. And along the way, hopefully I'll give you a bit of a feel for what it's like to be out there in the world in different uh, remote locations, whether it be a Madagascar village or a forest in Kenya or something like that, trying to find where these next, uh, next potentially uh, pandemic causing pathogens are coming from, because that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Um, I'll just check I can flick through this. Yep. All right. All right. So basically, just to give you a rundown on how I'm going to structure this today, I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little bit about me and just show you a couple of pictures to, to give you an idea of who I am and what I do. And then I'm going to explain what emerging infectious diseases are, where they come from and the risk factors for them, for pathogens uh, spilling over from animals into people, because that's ultimately what it all boils down to. Then I'm going to tell you about my research, uh, mainly in, um, this seems to be flicking through without me having much control over it. All right, just bear with me for a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you about three virus groups, Ebola viruses, coronaviruses, and hantavirus, because I want to put this into context where exactly coronaviruses fit into things. Um, and I, the, one of the best ways to do that is to give you some other examples. And then I'm going to use that to compare and contrast each of them against each other and use this for guiding where we go forward, what we can do about it in the future. And I've um, put a picture of me trying to lift a baby camel here just because it gives you a bit of an idea about, um, about what I do, the strange situations I find myself in. This was in um, doing field work in um, Western Sahara. So it's a conflict zone under Morocco. And we were there catching rodents and um, a bunch of camel herders came up to us one day and said, would you like to come to our, our tent for tea and come and have a look at our camel herds and things like that? And we said, yeah, great. So uh at one point in that i was trying to lift up the baby camels to see how much they weigh and it turns out they're surprisingly light a, a very young camel all right so uh just to give you a, a bit of an example of some of the situations the research situations i find myself in in the top left corner here is um is basically me doing my field work in um in Finland during winter, I'm holding a vole here. It's about minus 30 degrees Celsius. Not too sure what that is Fahrenheit, but it's probably quite similar. Um, and then I finished my PhD and thought, great, I have a lot more control over what I do now. 
I'm never going to do winter field work in uh, the north of any, well, the north of the world again. It's just terrible how cold it can get, and especially for someone from Australia. And I've, you know, roughly strayed true to that. I do um, sway a little bit into the north with field work every now and then. But a lot of what I've done since then is trying to track and understand um, mainly viruses that are in bats and rodents in different parts of the world, normally temperate parts. So the photo just under it is me taking a bat out of a mist net in um that was in a village in rural Madagascar. There's some bat nets we've set up across a river underneath that in rural Kenya. So these bat nets, the things we use to catch bats, they're essentially like big badminton nets. They're really fine mesh. And what happens is once the sun goes down, the bats come out, they do their normal echolocating, which is how they, um, they sense the world. They find um, food and avoid obstacles and things like that. And um, these nets with such fine mesh, the bats fly into them from time to time and they get stuck there and that's how we trap them. Uh, the middle picture is one of our sort of temporary labs we set up. This was in Barbados. We were looking for a hunter virus, which was spilling over from, we think, rodents to people because the hunter viruses generally come from rodents. So we were out there trapping uh, rodents and collecting samples to do virus diagnostics, and we need to set up these temporary labs where we go. And this was what we ended up with, finding an old mill build building, which was great because it's very open. You don't want to be um, cutting open animals and collecting samples in confined spaces, even though we're wearing full bioprotective equipment. So this was great, but it's also somewhere where we can store our, store our equipment um, and, you know, it's not going to rain on us and things like that. The picture next to it on the right is exactly the same thing. And this is in um, rural Kenya. So, again, we just set up these sort of mobile labs. We cut down bamboo and things like that, stick some tarps together and put them over the top, try to make it on a bit of an angle so the water doesn't build up and drip down onto us if it rains. And then we, um, we go about uh, uh, trapping our animals and collecting our samples. So that's me on the left of that picture uh, dissecting a bat to get samples to screen for an Ebola virus. And I'll go into that in a, a little bit more. And that's why we're taking such, um, such stringent and appropriate biosafety precautions. All right, so I want to set a bit of a context here, a bit of a scene. By the 1970s, antibiotics had been developed, vaccines had been developed, smallpox had been eradicated, the WHO announced that malaria was effectively controlled and basically as a, as a human population, as a species, we thought we were doing pretty well. We didn't think that infectious diseases would be a problem for humanity moving forward or at least not to the extent that they have been. And what we know now is that we were, we were dramatically wrong in that. Infectious diseases continue to cause about 25% of all human mortality. Now, I want to talk about a particular class of infectious diseases with this presentation. And what I'm going to talk about are emerging infectious diseases. So these are infectious diseases that have newly appeared in a population or those that have been known for some time but have rapidly increased in the incidence or geographical range. So COVID-19 is an emerging infectious disease. And you'll see on the map here, perhaps some familiar names. Um, there's Zika virus there down the uh, bottom left-hand corner, which originated in uh, Latin America. There's dengue virus. We've got uh, Marburg hemorrhagic fever and Ebola virus diseases coming from um, uh, from Central and Western Africa. There's even anthrax bioterrorism, which has pointed at, um, I think it was New York or somewhere on the East Coast of America. Uh, we've got the avian influences coming from different parts of Asia. So these uh, emerging infectious diseases are our pathogens that have the capability of causing epidemics and pandemics. And it's not just the, um, the toll that they take in terms of mortality and morbidity. They also take a really big toll in terms of 
of fear and what they do to economies and things like that. So there's a whole context here that's not just about how many deaths they cause. Like these sort of pathogens can inflict huge damage just by what they can potentially do. And that is a massive pandemic, which is what we're seeing right now. All right, so where do emerging infectious diseases come from? They basically come from animals. The majority of them, about 70% are what we call zoonoses. And what this means is a pathogen that is spilled over from animals to people. This process of spilling over, causing infection in a new host, and in our case, a person. That's what we're most concerned about most of the time. Um, so I'm really, I'm, I sometimes get it wrong, but I'm trying to be very particular here, the way I use the word disease and the way I use pathogen, the word pathogens. So COVID-19 is an emerging infectious disease and it is caused by the pathogen SARS coronavirus 2. Um, Diseases per se, they are not transmissible. What they are is the manifestation of that pathogen in the body, in the host, and the host response to it. But a, a disease isn't transmissible. A pathogen is transmissible from one person to another or from one host to another. And this process of tra transmission occurring from, say, an animal to a human is the process of spillover. And occasionally we see host switches in pathogens where they, they evolve their capabilities to be transmissible indefinitely in the new host species. So getting back to uh, these emerging infectious diseases, most of them come from animals and most of those come from wildlife. So our major source of emerging infectious diseases is wildlife. And um, that's what I'm trying to show in the figure here on the left. If you have a look at the last bar, which is basically when so the last time someone did a, um, a study on where these emerging infectious diseases come from, what you can see is most of them are zoonotic infections. The uh, part of the bar shaded black are non-zoonotic infections. But then out of those zoonotic infections, this white part of the bar, they are uh, they come from wildlife. So the bottom line here is that most of our emerging infectious diseases come from wildlife. All right, so what factors cause this spillover of pathogens from wildlife to people? And there was a study done quite a while ago. It was 2015, but it's still um, some of the best evidence we have and really nothing has changed from this time. And they've ranked the different factors in order of their importance that lead to spillover from animal pathogens to people. And at the very top of that list is changes in land use or agricultural practices. And second in that list is changes in human de uh, demographics and society. So basically what that is saying is habitat loss and fragmentation human encroachment into wildlife habitats. These are the driving forces of spillover of pathogens from animals to people. And this is really intuitive because what it does is it puts humans and uh, puts people into contact with wildlife and their pathogens. So no pathogen is gonna spill over from an animal to a person if we're not exposed to it. We all know that exposure to the pathogen is the first step in any sort of transmission. So if we have more opportunities to be exposed to wildlife and their pathogens, it's very natural that they're gonna spill over more often from animals to people. And you can just imagine it, you cut down a forest, the, um, the animals living in that forest, they either go locally extinct or perhaps completely extinct if that's the only place they're found, or they have to go somewhere else. And more and more, the only places for them to go are urban areas. So we're coming into contact with animals and their pathogens like we never have before. And I'll get into this a bit more towards the end. All right, so I'm building a bit of a scene here. We have, um, we have well, we have infectious diseases. We have a class of them called emerging infectious diseases. They mainly come from wildlife and environmental changes are driving that spillover event, that process by which an animal pathogen becomes a human pathogen. And I wanna give you a couple of examples here that really illustrate this occurring. 
And this is the emergence of Nipah virus and Hendra virus. So Nipah virus emerged in Malaysia in 1998. And what happened was there was a lot of forest clearing around the time. There were also a lot of pig, pig farms on the periphery of these forests. And uh, what the pig farmers thought is, well, we can make a bit of extra money here uh, planting some fruit trees and we can sell that fruit. We can eat it thing, uh, ourselves. So there's a bit of extra money to be made. So imagine you've got this forest being cut down, you've got pig farms nearby, and you've got all these fruit trees popping up around the pig farms. So the fruit bats that live in that forest, they've lost their natural environment. They have to go somewhere else, and lo and behold, they find these fruit trees around the pig farms and think, great, here's another food source. We can roost here. We can eat the fruit that's growing on these trees. These uh, fruit birds happen to carry a virus called Nipah virus. The virus is shed in their um, urine and feces and saliva. So imagine they're, they're hanging above the pig pens. They're uh, defecating into them. So there's virus being shed into the bottom of these pig pens. They're eating the fruit and they're getting their saliva on that fruit with um, the virus in it. They're dropping bits of partly eaten fruit into the pig pens. Naturally, these pigs are going to be exposed to the Nipah virus. And then people have close contact with those pigs. So that's how environmental um, fragmentation or destruction lent, changed the behaviour of the bats. There was an intermediate host involved with the pigs. And then we have more direct or extreme or intense contact with the pigs. And that virus is more likely to pass from the pigs to us. Just human contact with the bats is very unlikely in this scenario. And if none of those steps occurred from cutting down the forest to planting, well, to having the pig um, pens around that or close to that forest, to having fruit trees um, amongst those pig pens, to then people farming those pigs and having close contact with them, that's a series of steps that led to um, spillover of Nipah virus from bats to people. So something I'm really trying to emphasize through this is that everything's a process and there's lots of points in the process where we can do things about it. So Hendra virus emerged in Australia and it was a very similar story. Uh, natural habitat loss, the bats started roosting around um, trees in the farms where horses were kept and then they defecated and shed that virus onto the grasses. A horse comes along and eats the grass the horse gets sick, a vet is called to have a look at the horse, and more often than not, it was the vets and the owners of that those horses that then contracted Hendra virus. Um, hopefully this is making sense that a lot of disease emergence is driven by habitat loss and increased human and intermediate hosts have a big role in, um, I mean, increased contact with intermediate hosts have a big role in facilitating that spillover of certain viruses from bats, but also it can happen with other species to people. And I put the little picture of the movie Contagion down here because if you've watched it, they, um, at the end, how they depict the scenario of the virus emerging, it's actually how it played out with Nipah virus going from habitat loss to bats around pigs to bats being infected to Gwyneth Paltrow being infected with the virus from the pigs and that seeded a global pandemic. So obviously the movie was dramatised for Hollywood uh, audiences, but there, there's a lot of truth in how these things can emerge. And if you haven't seen the movie Contagion, I, I really recommend it. I know that they... Um, they collaborated, for lack of a better word, with scientists when they were writing it, and they introduced real concepts like R naught, which we saw introduced in the very first lecture of this course. So it's a good popular science way to get introduced to some of what can really happen. You need to ignore the dramatization for Hollywood purposes a little bit there, but they do introduce some um, real concepts in epidemiology and disease emergence in this movie. All right, so I'm going to talk a lot about bats and rodents, and there's a reason for this. They are associated with a lot of zoonotic infections. So a lot of infections that go from animals and wildlife in particular to people, they come from bats and rodents. And probably you've heard of some of these, like rabies virus, Marburg virus, Hendra virus, and Nipah virus, which I just spoke about. 
We're hearing a lot about coronaviruses and bats. We think Ebola virus came from bats. That really hasn't been uh, proven yet. The gold standard evidence for showing that a species is a host for a pathogen is being able to isolate live virus from that animal. And we haven't been able to do that with Ebola viruses and bats yet. Um, and this is, you know, problematic for several ways. Some viruses just don't grow well in cell culture. So essentially, we have a, a hierarchy of evidence going from virus isolation to positive PCR, which means we found genetic fragments of that virus in samples. It doesn't mean they're actually shedding that virus or the virus is still alive and capable of being transmitted. And then under that, we have serology, which uh, means antibodies. And all that really means is there's been exposure to a pathogen. And that's why we can't do, say, um, antibody tests for real-time diagnostics of coronavirus at the moment. What they do is they show up later. It shows previous exposure if they show up at all. But it doesn't show that someone is actively infected. And it doesn't show that they've actually been actively infected because when we give a vaccine, it's not active infection, but it shows that there's been exposure enough to elicit an immune response. So I'm saying this because we see things now like uh, we'll see media reports of cruise ships, for example, and how the virus might be detected in the cruise ships 15 days after anyone's left. But what they generally are is PCR results. So it doesn't mean that um, there's active infectious virus still being detected there. There's certain limitations in our diagnostic capacities and what these different diagnostic tools mean. And I, I, I could do a full presentation on that and we don't have time to go into it, but it's just I just wanna make the point that everything can't be taken on face value. All right, so I'm um, digressing a little bit here. Bats have lots of viruses and so do rodents. Maybe you've heard of some of the rodent viruses before as well. Hunter viruses are a big one and I do a lot of work with them. Uh, Lyme disease, which is actually a bacteria and so is plague. Uh, Lassa fever virus, a couple more bacteria and leptospirosis and tularemia. Um, and there's a reason that so many different zoonotic infections tend to come from bats and rodents. For a start, they're both mammals. And we, one, we have a couple of rules for, or a couple of principles for understanding risk factors for spillover from animals to people. And one of the big ones is phylogenetic distance. So we are more likely to get our infections, our spillover infections from closely related other species. And we're mammals, rodents and bats are mammals. Really, the greatest risk for, uh, oh, if it was just based on if everything was weighted equally, our greatest risk for spillover infections would come from non-human primates. But um, there's about, I just Googled it before this presentation, and there's 376 non or primates out there in total. There's 1,300 or over 1,300 different bat species out there. And there's over 2,000 different rodent species. So there's far more rodents and bats out there than any other mammal species. So just by weight of numbers, we're more likely to come in contact with these different mammals and be exposed to viruses they carry. And every now and then, and I really must emphasize it's a very rare event, one of those, one of those many thousands of different viruses they carry may spill over into people. And then even more rare is it might evolve the ability for person-to-person -person transmission. Uh, there's a few other things about bats and rodents that make them especially likely to host viruses and viruses that might spill over into people. Um, they have large populations. Again, I could do a, um, a whole lecture on density thresholds and um, density-dependent transmission, but just the point I want to make here is that the more of them there are in a population, so the more individuals of a particular species, the more likely they are to have different viruses and for viruses to persist in their populations. And they also come into contact with people, so close associations with people, and this is especially true for rodents. So we're likely to be exposed to them and their viruses. And I actually think of bats as the new rodents in a way because 
all the habitat loss we're seeing around the world at the moment, it's forcing bats into contact with us like what happened with rodents, say, 50 or 100 years ago. So right now we're almost at a point in time in our, our human history where we're coming into contact with bats, often through intermediate hosts, like I mentioned with our nipper and hendra and the pigs and horses, but we're in a way, in a direct or an indirect way, we're coming into contact with bats and their viruses like we never have before. And that's why we're starting to see things like SARS and COVID-19 and Nipah and Hendra and potentially Ebola viruses, and they're starting to pop up more and more often. And there's no reason to say, well, there's evidence to say that it's going to continue happening unless things are changed. Um, there's also something about these viruses. So the other big rule we have here is the mutation rate of different viruses. So the first big rule was phylogenetic distance constrains cross-species transmission. The other one is that um, RNA viruses in particular are more likely to be our emerging infectious diseases because during their re uh, replication process, there's more errors, there's more genetic variation that comes through the replication process. And that is, um, that is variability that natural selection can act upon. And then these viruses can evolve to persist in new hosts, which are potentially people. So imagine a virus that has evolved to do really well in, say, a bat, and it's lived in bats for thousands of years. It's not automatically going to evolve the ability to persist and be transmitted amongst people. And more often than not, uh, like vastly, vastly more often than not, that, uh, that ability is not going to evolve. But if it's coming from a closely related species, so there aren't that many changes that are needed or there's less than, say, something coming from a bird, and there's the ge uh, genetic variation for natural selection to act upon, that's how we get to a point, or these are the risk factors for being able to evolve that ability to be transmitted amongst people. And it's a series of bottlenecks, which I'll get to it there towards the end of this presentation. And it's a very, very unlikely scenario, but every now and then it does happen. As much as anything by weight of numbers, we are constantly exposed to different viruses and pathogens out there. And the vast, vast majority of them will never evolve the ability, will never infect a person for a start, and then will never evolve the ability to be transmitted amongst people. And I'll get some more into these uh, principles of it towards the end. But I'm, I'm really just trying to build a scene here. So now I want to talk about my own research in, um, in Kenya for a start and what we've been doing there and how it sort of feeds into these principles of spillover of wildlife pathogens. And I really want to give you a feel for what it's like to be out there in the field and the type of things we do, the questions we ask, and how you actually go about, you know, catching animals and searching for novel viruses. So when I was a postdoc at the University of Helsinki, I started a project in the Taita Hills of Kenya because the University of Helsinki happened to have a research station there. Um, and one that was vastly underused, actually. Not many people even at the university there know about it. But it's in a very unique area, which is really, really appropriate for studying spillover risk. So it's a part of the Eastern Arc mountain range, which is, imagine a mountain range that goes uh, across a lot of um, Kenya and into Tanzania. And on top of these mountains, you have the last cloud rainforest. So these pristine environments, but they've also been cut down. They've been shrinking for a long time and about 90% of it has been lost since the uh, 1950s. And I really think of these forests on the mountaintops there as islands in the sky. Um, and either side of this mountain range, uh, especially where I'm based in Kenya, you have two famous uh, national parks, Savo East and Savo West. And this is Savannah Plains, and they're very famous for the lions of Savo that um, ate a lot of people. Uh, that was about 100 years ago or more when they were trying to build a railroad to connect Africa. So there's a lot of books and uh, a couple of movies on the lions of Savo as well. But it's just a really unique um, part of the world. So if you look at the map on the right, you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner the Tater Hills there marked by that square. 
So very close to the border with Tanzania in the southeast corner of Kenya. And I've mentioned that um, it's biodiversity rich. So we've got the last sort of rainforest in the area. Um, it's undergoing rapid forest clearing. So people are expanding their little shareholder farms, like their uh, smallholder farms, I mean. So what's common in this sort of environment is people have um, a little house there. They have a, a small field with a, maybe corn planted there to feed their family. They might have a cow or two, a few goats and sheep. And actually in this area, a person's wealth or a household wealth is largely measured by how many cows they have. But constantly people are moving further and further into this forest. It's being cut down more and more. And people are coming into contact with the animals that live there and their pathogens as that happens. And what this all equates to, it's a, a disease emergence hotspot. So it's one of those parts of the world where the emergence of infectious diseases is more likely to happen than many others. And hopefully that's making sense now, how biodiversity, so more animals, more vi more different um, wildlife species, more viruses they carry, we're coming into contact with them more and more through forest clearing. And just having poor public health knowledge and infrastructure, a lot of infectious diseases, they might spill over a little bit, but they go unnoticed. And this is really important too. And I'm gonna give you an example of why it is. So I mentioned that most of our infectious diseases are likely to come from primates. If it was just a, everything was weighted equally rather than weight of numbers because there's more rodents and bats. And the, the perfect example or the key example of spillover of a primate pathogen into people is HIV. HIV started as simian immunodeficiency virus, so primate immunodeficiency virus. And now we have the equivalent, which is human immunodeficiency virus. And that came because it spilled over from primates to people. And it essentially evolved over at a period of time to become an exclusive human pathogen, which we now call HIV or HIV-1 to be exact. Um, but that didn't just happen in one foul swoop. So simian immunodeficiency virus, it was transmitted and had limited cycles in people several times before it evolved that ability for efficient person-to-person -person transmission and was able to evolve into HIV. So one of the things we can do is if we, or one of the risk factors is poor public health knowledge and infrastructure, because in a lot of these settings, most infections are presumptively uh, diagnosed as malaria and dengue a lot. There's a lot of these tropical vector-borne diseases in these places. So some of these cases could be small pockets of pathogens like uh, simian immunodeficiency virus being transmitted to people and causing little pockets of infection. And basically, they then have the ability to, to evolve to people people to, to test out what this new host is like and to, to adapt to it. And that's more likely to happen when there's poor public health knowledge and infrastructure, just because we don't recognise this is a new infection and we need to do something about it before it does get, or before it does evolve that ability for efficient human to human transmission. I hope this is making sense. It's a bit hard without getting a uh, feedback or heads nodding as I'm going, but, um, I'll touch on this a bit more towards the end. All right, so we went to this part of Kenya. It was one of the first bat studies done in the area. We have no idea what we're gonna find. And uh, in early 2016, we went there for a two week field expedition to essentially capture and survey bats and to take samples that we can use for virus diagnostics. We didn't know what pathogens they might be carrying or which different viruses they might be carrying but we thought it was worthwhile and we thought this was a, um, a very high biodiverse area. We didn't know how that relates to bats, of course. So we went there Unknown for two weeks. participant is now joining. We went there for two weeks and in that first two weeks, we caught at least 19 different bat species. And this is remarkable. It's an area about 10 miles across with 19 different bat species or more than 19. Some of them we still haven't been able to properly identified down to the species area. 10 new bat species were not known to be in this area at all. 
one of the bat species was not known to be in East Africa at all. So I just want to sort of emphasize that there's still these areas out there that we have remarkably little understanding of the sort of biodiversity that exists there. And this is these are mammals we're talking about. So imagine what it's like for insects, uh, everything else. And I've put a picture here um, of from the publication and the pictures of the different bat species we caught. And it's worth taking um taking a minute just to have a look at the bats. Bats are remarkable animals and we know very little about them because our senses don't align with them. So they're out at night, they use echolocation, we don't really hear them too much. We uh, unless you know what you're listening for, we certainly see them very rarely. But uh, if we turn the lights on at night, bats would bats are essentially the birds of the night. They're everywhere and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of their noses and ears are really remarkable because they've um, evolved that pro uh, that ability to to sense their world through echolocation. You'll see that some of the little ones down the bottom have really sharp teeth, and that's because they hunt insects. The three along the top are fruit bats, so they have really dull teeth because they're munching on soft fruits most of the time. Most of the fruit bats are about uh, probably three to ten so times the size of the little insectivorous bats, which are all the other ones from D to R in this uh, panel figure. They really are just remarkable creatures, and they are essential to our way of life, which is something I'll get into again at the end. So. Bats perform really important uh, ecosystem services, which we don't notice going on, but we would be overrun with pests if they weren't out there, with insects and things like that. A lot of our crops wouldn't grow because bats uh, are used for the pollination process and they help our seeds germinate by, um, by the process of digestion and taking them to our new areas. So it's something I'll touch on again at the end, but just eradicating bats is clearly not an option when it comes to uh, preventing spillover of pathogens from them to people. All right, so here's just a couple of photos of a sampling. We've got another in the bottom right-hand corner, another one of those mobile labs set up. We always do these in open spaces. We can't do them in enclosed spaces, even though we are uh, using full bioprotective gear because we don't want viruses in a confined room. Uh, we don't want the next person who potentially walks into that room and has no idea what we've been doing being exposed to a virus. And that's why even with what's going on now with COVID-19, it's much safer if you're talking to someone to be outside than inside because the virus particles essentially get diluted with all the air particles if they're in an open area. So here's uh, my, my um, collaborator from uh, Kenya, Dr. Paul Wabala. I think he's uh, testing the tension in the bat net he's setting up. So Paul is the, um, he is the Batman of uh, Eastern Africa and I'm very lucky to have him as a collaborator. He is a conservation biologist. So a big part of his job and motivation is the protection of bats. But we've realized we have a, we have a common need, a common priority to understand bats and the viruses that they carry while acknowledging the important ecosystem roles that bats perform and also conveying an important public health message that comes from bats. So just like I, my interests mainly come from understanding the pathogens they carry and protecting human health, I don't want to see bats uh, exterminate and I know that isn't a, a realistic solution to what's going on. Paul wants the protection of bats, as I do, and he also doesn't want to see people get diseases. So we have common interests here, and we come together in what we think and hope is a very responsible way of researching them and presenting a, a clear and balanced message for what's happening, what pathogens bats are carrying, and what can actually be done to protect ourselves from them. All right, so we went back to Kenya then in 2018 and 2019. What we're trying to do is sample as many um, different bat species as we can without sampling too many of the one species because we don't want to harm their populations. We're collecting things through the pictures of us doing dissections there, like 
like tissues, different organs, because different viruses go to different parts of the body, whether it be in a bat or a person during an infection. And so we're collecting different tissues. We're collecting blood samples and fecal samples and ectoparasites like ticks and fleas that are uh, feeding on the bats because they can serve as vectors for transmission of a virus from one bat to another and potentially from a bat to a person. Um, by now, we're up to over 25 distinct, distinct bat species that have been identified so far in this Tater Hills area. We think there's probably many more we haven't caught. Um, as a comparison, there's about 15 different bat species known in the state of Arkansas, and we've got over 25 in an area that is maybe 10 miles across. So this, uh, this really emphasizes what I'm talking about when I say biodiversity rich. Uh, you know, a few hundred years ago, perhaps Arkansas was like this as well, but the environments have been changed a lot since then. So there's a lot less uh, wildlife species and bats is an example of that. All right, so our first big surprise. Um, and this wasn't something we expected at all. We were originally initially screening for uh, Ebola viruses or filoviruses, which are that broad, broad group of Ebola viruses and uh, related viruses like Marburg virus. And the reason we screened for them first is because they cause very serious human disease. And we thought if we can screen for them in the, the highest containment lab, taking all the precautions, because it's really hard work, and we can show that they don't have them, then we can take the samples out of the, the highest level of containment in the lab and they're easier to work with. And we got a huge surprise when we actually found an Ebola virus in the bats at this stage. Um, so what we found was a virus called Bombali Ebola virus. And there's six known species of Ebola virus, including Bombali now. Uh, Bombali Ebola virus was first identified only a couple of months before we found it in Kenya. And it was identified in two bat species, Mops condylurus and Chytophon pumilis in Sierra Leone. So then we found it in Kenya a couple of months later. So unfortunately, we've just missed the opportunity to describe a new Ebola virus, the six, the, uh, only the six, seven known Ebola virus, which would have been a, a huge thing. But um, we still were the second to find it and we were the first to find it in East Africa. And we were also the first to find it in the tissues. So the previous study from Sierra Leone found it in the saliva and feces. And this, could, this doesn't mean that the virus is actually infecting the bat. It could be an insect. If the virus is carried by an insect, then we're probably going to find bits of that virus in the saliva and feces as well. Um, Ebola viruses are an, are an enigma, a really interesting enigma for someone like me because we have so little understanding of where they come from, where they're the wildlife reservoirs, where they hide in nature. Um, what normally happens when there's an outbreak of Ebola virus, and normally that's this uh, Zaire Ebola virus, which is listed under Bombali in the phylogenetic tree here. The most of the big outbreaks, especially the 2004 to 2016 ones, they're this virus species called Zaire. Uh, in fact, all of the different Ebola viruses found in Africa can infect people or are known to, except Bombali Ebola virus at this stage. And that's why we have to be very cautious and take a lot of precautions with our biosafety when we're researching it, when we think it's there. But um, yeah, they've normally been this Zaire Ebola virus. And what happens is when there's an outbreak, researchers go to that area and essentially, traditionally, they have killed and sampled thousands upon thousands of different animals, all different species from the insects to the mammals to the birds, you name it, they catch them all because they're trying to work out where are these Ebola viruses coming from. And Ebola viruses are such an, an enigma, normally they all come back negative. Uh, it's very rare to find an Ebola virus in wildlife. So we did, we found it in the tissues and again, we just found one bat that was positive, but we were able to get full genetic sequences of it. We were able to compare one tissue to another. And what we found is that the highest viral load, so the part of the body where the most virus is, happens to be the lung. 
And we also found very high viral loads in a mouse swab. So this can give us some clues about how it's transmitted. It's likely to be respiratory transmission from um, bat to bat, which is, it may seem like very weak evidence, and it is, but when it comes to Ebola virus and understanding how they're maintained and transmitted in nature, it's really, really important because we just understand so little about them. Um, so we also started screening people. So I mentioned how that people aren't tested for things like Ebola viruses in these rural clinics. And there's some um, there's some photos down the bottom there of what these rural clinics look like and the, the local hospital. Um, it's not the sort of place where they have a big state-of-the-art diagnostic lab, you know, in the basement or in the back room or anything like that. The doctor says, yeah, I've seen these symptoms a bunch of times. You've probably got malaria. You know, if you stay sick, maybe come back. If you don't survive it, well, that's what happens a lot of the time. And otherwise, you're going to recover and, you know, probably be fine after that. There's not a lot of follow-up. It's not a, a public health system like we know it. So we wanted to understand perhaps the infections like this Bombali Ebola virus which we, we think are probably likely to spill over because they're close relatives, all the other Ebola viruses do. So it's something we have to watch closely. Maybe they already are and we don't know about it. We don't want to give them the opportunity for these like pockets of local transmission, like what happened with simian immunodeficiency virus and HIV. The earlier we can detect these things are happening, the better our chances are of stopping them becoming global pandemics, for example. So what we did was we got blood samples from febrile patients that were reporting to these clinics. So these are people with a fever and we don't, and the doctors don't really know what they are. Maybe they did come back negative for a malaria test and we got samples for them and we've been screening them for Ebola viruses to try and see if we can find the early stages of these spillover infections. And actually, we um, did surveys of the patients as well, and we particularly focused our screening efforts on people who have had contact with bats. So bats roost in the uh, roofs of a lot of um, these sort of, excuse me, these houses, people who live in these rural villages. And in fact, the bat species which carries Bombali virus is an urban rooster. A lot of our trapping around Kenya is from the house roofs of people. Um, so I just want to sort of sum up what we've been finding here. So we found the first wildlife-borne Ebola virus in East Africa. So if you have a look at the main map in the figure here, you'll see a part A and a part B on it. Part A is um, Sierra Leone, where the virus was first found, and uh, part B is Kenya, where we've found it now. And they are thousands of miles apart. This bat species isn't thought to travel far at all. We've actually just got some funding from the Honours Co College, thank you, to track the movement of um, this Mops Kundalurus bat species to understand how far it moves and how it comes into contact with people, where those exposure opportunities are. But what we think is it won't move more than, I don't know, maybe in the tens of miles to up to 100. So it's very widespread in Africa, but we think an infected bat didn't fly from Sierra Leone to Kenya. So probably this bat, this virus is widespread in this bat species over much of sub-Saharan Africa. So it really changes what we know about the geography of Ebola viruses. Previously, what we understood about Ebola viruses and the risk of them emerging, it was basically restricted to Central and Western Africa. So now we're saying, all right, there is something we should be watching on East Africa. Well, there is an Ebola virus we should be watching in East Africa as well. And this is a big part of the world. All right, and so we've done other screening and so have other people since then. And I'll just quickly touch on this. So I need to um, speed a lot, up a little bit so I get through my presentation. But there's been Bombali virus again found uh, right next to Sierra Leone in Guinea, which is... Um, the arrow to the left of the main figure here. And we've also found it on the east, uh, on the west uh, edge of the Kenyan border. So on the border with uh, Uganda, we've now found multiple of these Mops Kundalurus bats, which carry Bombali virus or infected with Bombali virus. <coughs> 
So there's a really interesting and important picture which is uh, emerging from all of this. I mentioned how Ebola viruses have been such an enigma for so long and that we haven't known anything about where they are in nature. And if we understand what's happening in nature, how they're maintained in the wild, we know how we can understand how people come into contact with them and we can put policies and strategies in place to try and mitigate that. Um, and so what's happening now is we're starting to see Bombali virus is widespread in Africa. We've got four distinct sites now. So where we found it in Kenya, the two sites are about 750 kilometres apart. I don't know, maybe 500 miles. Um, and it always seems to be this same bat species. We've screened a lot of different bat species for it and we've only found it in this one species. So a really important picture is emerging that we might have a wildlife reservoir for an Ebola virus and something that we can use to actually study how an Ebola virus is maintained and transmitted in nature. And this is really important in the, the type of thing I'm trying to convince the NIH to give me money to study and yeah, we'll see where we go from there. But it it's, it's, hasn't been done before, so I'm very excited by it. All right, so now I want to turn my attention to coronaviruses <coughs> and some of the work we've been doing in Kenya with coronaviruses. So coronaviruses are best known for SARS and MERS and now COVID-19, and these are the diseases caused by different coronaviruses, not the virus itself. And coronaviruses are split into four clades phylogenetically. And these are alpha coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses, gamma coronaviruses, and delta coronaviruses. And alpha and beta coronaviruses in, can infect mammals. They're found in mammals, whereas delta and gamma coronaviruses are mainly found in birds. So SARS and MERS and COVID-19 they are all caused by viruses or coronaviruses that are classified as beta coronaviruses. So the point I want to make out here is there are an awful lot of coronaviruses out there in nature, and it's a fraction of them have spilled over into people, and then some of them have evolved the ability for efficient human-to-human -human transmission. But bats are believed to be the ancestral host of coronaviruses because we see more diversity, more genetic diversity, more different uh, species of coronaviruses coming from bats than anything else. It's not to say we're not going to focus on some taxa of animals in the future and realise, hey, there's actually more coronaviruses here and maybe 10,000 years ago they spilled from them and then into bats and then into everything else. We just don't know. But current evidence indicates that bats are the ancestral reservoir for coronaviruses. And um, I've just put a table here that there's no need to go through or anything like that. I'm just going to summarize the main findings. And this was a study that basically it was a literature review, which was done in 2014. So it's only up until 2014. And all the different coronaviruses and bat species that were identified and where they're found. And you, the first group is in America. So there's a lot of bats here that carry different coronaviruses as well. And really, that's nothing to be worried about most of the time. There's a lot in Europe. There's a lot in Africa. There's a lot in Asia. Um, I put the, the title of a paper that I was recently involved in that was published where it was the first report of coronaviruses in northern European bats. So basically what happens here is the more we look, the more we find things. I mentioned, you know, Bombali Ebola virus has probably been out there in bat species or in this Mops condylaris bat species for thousands of years. And, you know, we finally got the, um, the technology, the ability to sequence whole viruses and identify the samples and went out there and did it. And hey, lo and behold, we found an Ebola virus. So the more we look for things, the more we find them. It's, it doesn't mean the risk of contracting them has changed at all. We know that a, um, you know, a huge outbreak of Bombali Ebola virus has not swept through Africa and it hasn't uh, spread to other parts of the world. Doesn't mean that it can't happen in the future, but we have to be proportional about the risk here. There's a lot of different viruses out there and the vast, vast majority of them are not going to infect us. 
and those that do, the vast, vast majority of those are not going to evolve the ability to be transmitted from person to person. All right, so what we have been trying to understand, and this is just preliminary results here, we've been trying to understand how easily coronaviruses spread between different, um, different species and different groups of taxa, so say bats and rodents and livestock, which contain many different species within them. What we're trying to understand is how readily these coronaviruses spread amongst them. We're trying to understand how, how easily spillover happens. And we, we probably know about it if it was happening to people a lot, but how easily do coronaviruses spread from, from bats to say rodents and livestock who are more likely to come into contact with these viruses because you know, we know that livestock feed on grasses under trees where bats may be roosting, they might be shedding virus onto the grasses, so livestock then eats it. So that's going to happen a lot more than, say, um, transmission to people. So we can use these different species and different components of ecosystems for sentinels to, as sentinels to understand the propensity of different viruses to spill over and the risks they might pose to people. And that's what we've been trying to do in, um, in the Tater Hills of Kenya. So to identify different host virus relationships, coronavirus relationships, and which hosts they're associated with. And basically what we've found is we've found coronaviruses in a few species of bats, not too many, and potentially one species of rodents. So we're tr still trying to get the um, full sequences of these viruses, but we know there are some coronaviruses out there, but it's not like we thought it would be. It's not like they're in half of the different bat species or half of the different rodents. So we think they're not spilling over too often, and we found no evidence of coronaviruses in the livestock there. I forgot to mention, this is um, in the top right corner here. It's um, Dr. Joseph Ogola, who is a veterinarian in Kenya, and he's doing his PhD on coronaviruses, and I co-supervise him at the University of Nairobi. So he's done a really good job of going out there and sampling the different livestock. And um, I normally have a video I show about now, which is of the, body, the picture underneath of the camel. And it's just really interesting how they uh, sample camels. What they do is they tie up one leg so the camel can't run away. People hold the camel in place and then someone sticks a needle, a syringe to take blood into the jugular vein of that camel. The blood is drawn, they untie the leg and the camel goes away. It's a really interesting process that, that looks um, yeah, quite interesting and remarkable when you see a, a little video of it being done. But yeah, so Joseph has been leading all of this, um, this work in Kenya with the livestock sampling in particular. And we really wouldn't be able to do this sort of research in, in, um, in a place like rural Africa if we didn't have these really strong, um, these really strong connections and bonds to local institutions and people. And it's also really important that, you know, we do our part for knowledge transfer and capacity building through things like co-supervising um, students and my colleagues in Helsinki, which is a diagnostic lab. I'm more of a field researcher, but they've been working with the University of Nairobi to set up diagnostic capabilities for things like emerging infectious diseases. All right, so we found some, but not a whole lot of coronaviruses. Uh, we, what we can say is they're present in a small number of bat and rodent species, absent from livestock. And what it indicates is coronaviruses largely display host fidelity. So while they are in lots of different, uh, well, in some different species, they're not readily spilling over <coughs> from one to the next, at least not in real time. But over evolutionary history, which is a completely different time frame, we do know that um, coronaviruses spill over from one species to another, one bat species to another, for example, or a bat to a rodent. And then we see host switches occur where a new virus evolves, which is exclusive to that new species. But you know, that might happen every hundred years or every thousand years. It's not like because there is a coronavirus out there, we're going to get it. So it's, it's an important distinction to understand that these are rare events, even between bats and rodents that are in contact with each other, every day have been for hundreds and thousands of years. 
And the last group of viruses, I want to talk about are hunter viruses. And I'm just going to introduce this very briefly, and it's for a point of contrast with the other two viruses. So again, hunter viruses are a diverse group of viruses. They're primarily associated with rodents, <coughs> also found in moles and shrews, and we've also found some um, insect-borne hunter viruses lately, but all the hunter viruses which cause human disease, all that we know about at this point come from rodents. And like many viruses, uh, they're shed in the saliva and excreta of the rodents, and that's how people and other rodents um, contract them, become infected with them. So for a lot of these things, we're a dead-end host. We're not a part of the virus isn't trying to get from rodent or bat to us. We're just a, a side effect because we came into contact with it and we inhaled that virus as time went by. And so this picture uh, to the right of the slide, it's to depict what happens, a typical hunter virus transmission setting. So we have the hunter virus infected rodents in red and they're shedding virus into the environment. Uh, the non-infected rodent comes along and might inhale that virus and become infected. And really these viruses cause little to no harm in the rodent host. But occasionally a person is coming is in that same environment you know, they might scuff up the dirt and um, they inhale virus that way. So this virus we know survives for about two weeks in the environment. So it's evolved the ability for persistence in the environment. And the, the, these like selection pressures like uh, persistence in the environment, they, they act on different viruses based on the way that they're transmitted. So if we take a sexually transmitted infection, for example, there's extremely little selection pressure for that virus to evolve persistence in the environment uh, because it's transmitted only through very direct contact. Uh, something like the hunter virus, which is shed into the environment, there's going to be selection pressure for persistence in the environment. And we're sort of trying to understand where something like the virus which causes COVID-19 fits into this spectrum now. Uh, we think it's, you know, it's somewhere along the lines of influenza where they can survive for an extended period of time in the air. They can survive for potentially a couple of days on different surfaces, but it's certainly not like a hunter virus of weeks in the environment. Well, at this stage, we, we don't think that happens. And it's not like a sexually transmitted infection where it might be minutes to hours in the environment. So hunter viruses, there's a couple of them which cause human diseases, and we see very, uh, ver a very spectrum of the severity of these human diseases. So each year there's thousands of cases of a hunter virus called Pumla hunter virus in, um, in Europe or in the old world. And I've actually had this infection. It, it's not great at all. It was like a really severe flu where I basically just... Um, slept for a couple of days, it can cause uh, renal symptoms. Uh, people end up in hospital on dialysis sometimes and occasionally people die from it. Uh, the hunter virus in, in America is called Sinombre hunter virus, the main one, and that has about a 40% case fatality rate. So about 40% of people <coughs> that develop this infection, they, they actually die. So that can be very serious. And again, don't pay much attention to this table. The main thing I want to make, the main point I want to make about it is that um, there are a lot of hunter viruses out there as well. And only a couple of them are actually really researched, the ones that cause most human diseases. All the others are classified as what we call neglected diseases. And this table is a list of those neglected hunter viruses. And my student, Nathaniel Mull, did a, um, a review on neglected hunter viruses in America, in North and South America. And these are a list of all the different hunter viruses he, he found. And at least half of those are known to cause human infection. So one of the points I'm trying to get across here is that these emergence of infections, it isn't strictly isolated to particular areas. There's nothing to say that one of these hunter viruses, which occasionally is transmitted to people, won't evolve that ability for 
efficient human to human transmission and become a global problem. It's not to say that can't happen tomorrow. Like when it comes to emerging infectious diseases, we are all in this together as a world. And it really can't happen anywhere. There, it's more likely to happen in some places due to different um, risk factors, particularly the things I went into about biodiversity and um, and our relationship with the environment and what that does for coming into contact with different wildlife and their pathogens. But really, it's just a game of numbers. This can happen anywhere. It's a fundamental process. And this... Um, this sort of blaming and things that it just it's it's so counterproductive to understanding the principles of where spillover infections come from and actually putting things in place for preventing them. All right, so I've spoken about three viruses and I just want to briefly at the end here contrast them a little bit, what we understand about them and things like that. So the likelihood of spillover going from an animal to a human we think, we think Ebola virus is it happens very rarely, but when it does happen, transmission amongst people is likely to occur, and we see very severe diseases, up to 90% case fatality rates with Ebola viruses. Coronaviruses, they're sort of um, in the middle of hunter viruses and Ebola viruses, so they, they spill over a little bit, uh, you know, semi-often. It seems like more often than, say, Ebola viruses, we do now have several examples. I think there's seven or eight coronaviruses that we know can spill over, have spilled over from animals to people and caused human infection. And we've seen different extents for which they've evolved the ability to be transmitted from person to person. Obviously, we've seen where it's happened in a really effective way right now with COVID-19. Hunter viruses, they spill over very, very often. Um, we, there's thousands of human cases of hunter viruses each year, and they are all spillover events from rodent to human. And they have not evolved the ability to be transmitted from person to person. These are all RNA viruses. There's all the same environmental components. And we, we don't understand a lot about why certain viruses are more likely to spill over why they're likely to evolve the ability to be transmitted from person to person, and why there's so much uh, sever uh, variation in the severity of diseases they cause. So I'm just trying to tell you really what this is about as a process and give these different examples to contrast each other. And a really nice review came out in 2017, which um, I gave as the reading for the students with this presentation. And basically what it breaks this down to and what the figure on the right shows is it's a series of bottlenecks. So we could look at rabies up the top there where it's very likely to go from an animal to a human if there's exposure to that virus. So say if a, if a dog infected with rabies virus bites you, you are likely to get that infection. I can't emphasize enough if you think you may have been in contact with a rabid animal to go get a post-exposure shot, because if you don't, you're very likely to get the infection and it has a case fatality rate of 100%. We look at the other end of the spectrum at our Ebola virus, and it's much less likely to spill over from an animal reservoir into people. But when it does, it's likely to make it th all the way through to those, to avoid those within host barriers. And it's more likely to be transmitted to person to person than say rabies virus, which has never evolved that ability. Where well, there's a couple of little case studies where it has, but I won't go into them. So another way of breaking this down is through a series of stages. And this is a paper from 2007, which I love showing in presentation, because it really shows how this process from being an, an exclusive wildlife pathogen to an exclusive human pathogen, it really is a process. So what they did was they broke this down into five different stages, where something is an exclusive animal pathogen, where it's transmitted from animals to people and goes no further. So again, an example of this is our rabies virus or our hunter viruses. Uh, where we also have limited cycles of infection in people, but not big, big outbreaks. So that'd be our stage three here. 
We can then have extended transmission cycles in people. And then after that, we have where the pathogens evolve to be an exclusive human pathogen. So it's no longer an animal pathogen anymore. So we have our examples of these different stages. Rabies, it just goes from animal to person and doesn't go any further. Ebola virus, when this figure was made in 2017, there were only limited outbreaks known to occur in people. But now since 2007, and this is why I like showing this um, figure, that has moved one step along. So we now see extended outbreaks of Ebola virus in people. And that happened from 2014 to 2016. And then um, in 2018, we saw a second largest Ebola virus outbreak again. Dengue virus, we saw long outbreaks. We've been seeing long outbreaks of dengue virus up until 2007. And now dengue virus has moved one step along as well, and it's essentially an exclusive human pathogen. HIV had evolved to be an exclusive human pathogen quite a while ago, and we just know it as a human pathogen. And a lot of people don't know that it went through these spillover processes. It was a, an, a, a primate virus, which now is a new virus in people. And hopefully you're starting to get a picture of this process. I'm really trying to... um emphasize the conceptual underpinnings of how a disease goes or how a pathogen goes from being an animal pathogen to a human pathogen and the risk factors and what we can do about it. And just to, to harp on this again, we know that habitat loss, fragmentation, human encroachment into wildlife habitats, globalization, these are all risk factors for spillover of pathogens from wildlife to people because it brings us into contact with wildlife and those pathogens. And so obviously there's practical steps we can do here to protect our environment, protect the, um, the health of animals and ecosystems because it has very direct relevance to our own health in terms of infectious disease outbreaks. Um, and then I uh, just to emphasize how interconnected we are in all of this, when a pathogen, when disease emerges in people, it doesn't matter where it emerges. If it, people get from anywhere, to, basically a person can get from anywhere to anywhere else within about 36 hours. And the incubation period for, a, um, for an infection is normally several days to weeks. So from when someone becomes infected to when they start showing symptoms to when they're actually going to trigger that there's something wrong when they get a temperature test when they're going through airport screening and things like that. And a, a part of that is often they can be shedding the virus. So our ability to stop virus spread through air, airport screening and things like that, it's important, but it's not going to stop at most infections because before we become symptomatic, we can actually be transmitting infections. And just to give, I went to the FAA website recently and they handle over 44,000 daily flights on average. There's 5,000 aircraft in the sky at any one time. There's just under 3 million passengers flying daily in and out of US airports. Like, you know, we, we have to combat these things on a global scale. We're, we're all connected in this. They can emerge anywhere and they can get to anywhere else quite quickly. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have airport screening and things like that because it does slow it down, but generally it's not going to prevent a pathogen or a disease from spreading from one area to another. Um, so there's been a really big fear amongst my research community that, that we've entered a time, an age of pandemics, where what we're doing to the environment is bringing us into contact with... Um, with animals and their pathogens like has never been happening before. Um, and that when something does emerge, it's gonna quickly spread around the world. So I mentioned that, you know, we're flying more interconnectedness through flights and things like that is more than ever. Just as a, um, an example, in 2018, when we had our great Spanish flu outbreak or pandemic, we were a population of 2 billion people. Now we're a population of 8 billion people. Like the capacity for pathogens to be transmitted from person to person is like it's never been before. And there's starting to be some warnings about that. There's been books written, obviously the movie Contagion. If you'd like a good book about this process of spillover, I really recommend Spillover by David Quarman. I really like the way he writes about it. He, um, he does a lot of extensive research. 
He actually Skyped with my disease ecology class last semester because we read his book and he told us all about what goes into it. And um, it's a really good popular science introduction to sort of how we find ourselves in a place and time. And really things can be done with the way we treat our environment and targeted research in certain areas to, to combat this risk of spillover and disease emergence or pandemics. Um, so the World Health Organization, so I'm just going to tell you with this last uh, couple of slides about some of the things that are being done, what, what's being done with research to try and, I guess, understand these risks and combat them. The WHO has their lists of priority infections that we're watching that we think we know they infect people and we're, we're watching them closely and wondering if they're going to evolve that ability to be really efficiently transmitted from person to person and spread throughout the world. They have several they list, and Ebola viruses are there, Zika, Nipah virus, the one I mentioned, MERS and SARS are another. There's nothing to say they can't come back with SARS, and we see occasional spillover of MERS, and we're wondering, will it evolve for that next step? They also have a disease X, which is the one we didn't know about, the one we didn't see coming, and that's really what COVID-19 is at the moment. Uh, there's been a couple of big projects to try and document the virus diversity that's out there. And one of them is the Global Virome Project. Another is the PREDICT Project, which is a big consortium that's administered through uh, UFC Davis. Uh, you might have seen them in the news lately. Their funding cycle ran out at the end of its five years. And there were a lot of, um, a lot of newspaper articles about how funding's been shut off for them. But uh, it's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, but the bottom line with all of these, with these sorts of projects is they're going out there, they're searching for novel viruses and they're finding thousands and thousands of them. But that doesn't really tell us much about which ones really pose risk to human health. It's only an absolute minority of those that might. And it would be great if we had a way to do it. And there was a paper published in the journal Nature um, a couple of years ago now where they're saying one of the key take home messages of that was that the most effective and realistic way to fight outbreaks is to monitor human populations in the countries and locations that are most vulnerable to infectious diseases. So what this means is we've got to find the early stages of disease emergence and try and control them there at the source, which is what we were doing um, or what we've been doing and what we'll continue to do in the Tater Hills. So we've identified it as a high risk area. We've said that um, there, we've identified that there is an Ebola virus there that poses, poses a really what we think is a substantial risk to human health. And then we're monitoring human populations in the area to say, okay, is it spilling over? And we want to identify it when it does and really control that as quickly as we can. Um, I won't really go into this, but I just want to mention that bats perform really critical ecosystem services. Like getting rid of bats is just not an option. They're, where do we draw the line? Do we get rid of bats? Then we get rid of rodents. We get rid of primates. Uh, our way of life, our quality of life, would change dramatically if we did. And a lot of what I've been doing has been a, a real learning curve in PR as well, because we have to be really careful how we convey these messages, especially when we found that new Ebola virus, because people want to know where it came from and basically go there and eliminate all the bats or you know, a very minority, but it's something we don't want to happen. And there's a really good example of where Marburg virus was found in a cave, in a mining cave in Uganda. Uh, People went there and exterminated the bats. The bats came back and there was actually high prevalence of Marburg virus in the bat populations because it really disrupted their, um, their social structure and led to greater transmission of the virus within the bat populations. So ultimately what this all comes back to is this concept of One Health, which was introduced uh, the other day. And what, the way I look at it is that human health is dependent on animal and environmental health. So to protect our own health, we need to protect wildlife species and we need to protect the environment. And this can be a really powerful tool for conservation because while someone might not care about protecting an environment, they might compare, uh, care about their own health. So if we can convey this message in a really holistic way, then maybe it'll have... Um, you know, more meaningful conservation and public health outcomes. 
And that is all I've got to tell you today. So thank you. Zounds. That was exceptional, Dr. Forbes. I can see it now. Honors College Signature Seminar, One Health. Are you in? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, good. That's on record now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there's like 50 oh. witnesses or something. <laughs> well, I... Um, I knew the environmental piece was so important, and it certainly come up in a number of other talks, but this was a real seal on that in crucial aspect of the yeah. story. So thank you so much for that. No worries. And yeah, just to say, a lot of people are asking what they can do, what can be done to prevent disease outbreaks. And, and this is really, for me, the bottom line of what it all comes down to, caring about the environment, protecting the environment. And showing this holistic message to other people so they get that. Well, you certainly made that very, very clear. It was fantastic.